once I moved away from the border, you know, I became much more attracted to it. And I think that's really normal. I think once you're living up close to something, you kind of can't see it. And then it's, it's a bit impressionistic. And then when you step away from it, you're able to see it more clearly. And so um, once I heard all these stories and I heard my mom telling me these stories about the border itself, she took me there for the first time um, when I was an undergrad. And so happens that there were like three migrants from different parts of Mexico that were sleeping on the beach. And they told me their stories of how they had gone on trains and cars on and foot to get there. And they were sleeping on the beach trying to cross um, on the water, like swim across. And they had already been deported. And so it, it was just kind of like this awakening moment, I think, of this whole new world I began to investigate and become really intrigued by. Because when you come and go, when you have the access and the papers, you really don't notice it. You know, you're kind of, um, you go through, through, through the spaces much more freely. But I think once you start hitting and getting the friction of that space and seeing who doesn't get to go, um, you start paying more attention and hearing those stories of like why people want to go, what's happened, why they've been deported, you know, what that journey has like sounded and looked like and felt like. And I think those stories are, are really worth telling. Did you, when did you move to the U.S. permanently? Does your mom still live? In no, all my, my folks, um, they both live in, in San Diego. And we moved when I was 10 or 11. I think I was 11 um, when I was going to fifth grade. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it was a bit of a, it was definitely a shock, you know, very different. What was, I guess, uh, yeah, the question I, I've been asking everybody who's, you know, moved to another country, what was, what did it feel like for you when you left Mexico, like when you knew that there was kind of, I don't know if there was no coming back, I mean, you might go back a little bit, what was that feeling, what was going through your mind? I think when, when I was in Mexico, the idea seemed really exciting because the other side, el otro lado, that's how you call, we call the states um, when I was living in Mexico and people that went to the other side, um, they would bring back like exotic candy and shoes and clothing and like, you know, the more materialistic capitalistic side of like, and when you're, when you're 10 and you know, all these things are being kind of, they're shiny and they're different and they're new. And so if it's very luring, um, but then once we actually crossed and we arrived to San Diego, I just remember just like feeling this sense of overwhelming space of just because everything was so distant and it was so far and it just nothing felt warm and close by or cozy. It was just sprawled. Everything looked the same, everything. And, and at first I remember I was like, oh, everything's so clean. That's really nice, you know? But <laughs> then you're like, wow, there's no character. There's no, you know, in Mexico, it's like a pink house is next to a mustard yellow house that's next to like a green house that's next to a blue house. And it's, they look sometimes like cakes, you know, like, you know, birthday cakes or something lined up next to each other. But it, I remember also one of the first times I was introduced to someone, to an adult, and I leaned in to give, it, give them a kiss. As a, that's how you know you give salutations, or you when you meet someone in Mexico. And they actually physically pushed me, and I was so I was traumatized. You know, as a kid, I was like, well, first of all, like I was shoved away, and I was like, what am I doing wrong? You know, like why is this interaction, why is my behavior wrong? Where I'm taught that you know good manners were to like when you get introduced, you kiss someone on the cheek. As a, as a formality, you know, and all of a sudden it was wrong, like I had to, so there was all these retraining um, behaviors, especially like I felt like everything was like pushing you farther away from people, you know, it was all about keeping more distance, it was all about like separating as opposed to coming together, and Mexico was more about like sit next to your aunt and ask them questions, and in the States it was more like be quiet and sit over there, you know. And so instead of integration, it was more about separation. And I think that was one of the hardest things for me when I first moved to the States. Do you think that that, um, I'm just going to check the audio. Too. 
So do you think that that, um, I mean, obviously everything in your life affected the way that you produce art. Yeah. When did you start to make art and like maybe compare like for when you were in Mexico, then maybe that transition, like anything major change? When was the time that you really had a breakthrough and realized, I want to be an artist? Well, I think that was a little bit different because um, different in the sense that I think had I stayed in Mexico, it would have never happened, you know? And the possibility of being an artist was something that presented itself here. Um, but art was always just part of me. Like, I remember drawing from... You know, my mom has napkins of when I was two years old, and I said, I drew a horse, and it's like <laughs> four sticks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and a round thing on the top. And that's a horse, according to me. But um, it, 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 it's something that I just, I, n I never knew when it, it's just always been around. I can't locate the time frame in which I accessed it. It was always just, even when I put it away for periods of time, I can always... It's, it's very faithful, you know, I can always come back to it and I can start kind of going into, into a zone and, 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 and literally going into a dark space with my head and ideas will just come up. And I think that my parents did this brilliant thing in which they continuously put books in, my, in front of me, like, you know, coffee table books with you know, Syrah and... and um, Dali and the I mean they love the surrealist so there was always like a Magritte book around and um, impressionist and impressionist books as well and my mom lo loved Bosch and so there were like posters and um, art was always just around me and I didn't really didn't I didn't think that other people grew up without it you know just in their home but then when I went to school the part of my education never, I never had access to it. So I wasn't educated on it, and nor was I told how to do it. But it just lived around me. And then my, my dad always, um, both my mom and my dad would always give me books that were um, heavily like magic realist books. And so I think that really was something that spurred my imagination quite a bit and just um, created all these visuals for me to just interpret in my own brain as what these things might look like. Um, and I think that that was definitely something that fueled a way of thinking, a way of seeing the world, or a way of expressing uh, yourself. And but then, you know, like I said, parallel to that, none of my education—it was always about right and wrong. It was always about. I went to Catholic high school. I went to Catholic middle school. It was there was never an art program or an art class. Um, so none of my none of my classmates knew I could draw or um, that was something I just did in my in my room by myself you know for hours um, and it wasn't until I went to community college you know that I took my first sculpture class and and I, I fell in love with it and it wasn't until my teacher actually told me to go to like portfolio day for the art institute that it was visiting coincidentally and I was like, what's a portfolio? And she told me, you know, just take photos and bring some of the drawings or bring anything that you've done. And literally the Art Institute gave me a scholarship on the spot. I brought in this like drawing that I had done. My mom bought um, butcher paper and I had, I would, I would unroll it on one side and there were these crazy horses that I would draw with oil pastels and there were all these um, kind of phobist colors and the horses were like intertwined. And so I would, in my room, in my tiny room, like I would scroll it, draw parts of it, and then have, have to scroll it into it and like unscroll the other. And so it was like 25 meters long, the drawing. And not 25 meters long, um, like 20 feet, 25 feet long, you know. Um, and it just, I took that drawing to, to the interview and they were just like, who are you? <laughs> you know, where'd you come from? And I was like, well, I just did that in my room, you know, like over a couple months. And, and then I was here. Cool. Yeah, it exists in San Diego. My mom still has it. Like we, we, we took it to Kinko's and had it, um, how do you say when they, the plastic gets melted on top of it? Laminated, laminated. And we had it laminated, but it got, the machine got so hot because it was so long that it started melting the oil pastels. So there's this one part where it's like melted oil pastel on the drawing. It's really funny. 
Um, my mom was freaking out. She's like, turn the machine off. <laughs> You're going to win the drawing. I was like, just, let's just do it. Um, but yeah, I, I think like, you know, art, art's definitely more accessible in the United States. It's not a way of life. It's not a, very few people get to do it in Mexico and very, very specific cities. I think in the States, there's more of a possibility and there's more space and there's more access to it and there's more funding to, for it as well. In Mexico, it's, it's, it's so limiting and it mostly exists like within three cities, you know. So, um, uh, had I, you know, had had we stayed in Tampico, where where I grew up, I just I don't think I would have ever had access to it, you know. So you've come a long way. <laughs> with that first, the first word. Yeah. Can you maybe like bring up speed on what you've been doing uh, professionally in your teaching career, and maybe lead into the going back to the border. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, the border was something that I had to even get, I, I had to like travel more and get farther away to be able to actually come back to it. Because um, I was doing, you know, I was doing a series of actions there. Even when I was in grad school, I would go and like sweep the sand or mop the beach, you know, in my, in the typical like little black dress and the stilettos. But when I finished grad school, you know, I went, I did, uh, I did a residency in Haiti, and I was there for two months, and then I came back, and then I, I did some work um, later in Cape Town in South Africa. And so this constant, in each place I did it, there was always these stories of migrating, of migration that occurred, and they were so interesting, and to see the point of origin, and then to see where people would end up. And um, in the case of, of Haiti, it was so funny because the art center was located next to um, a prostitute house, and so there were Dominicans that worked there. There were blonde Dominicans, and there were one of there were the other few because I was one of the few white people, like white quote unquote people in the in the town in Jacmel, and the other the other women that were also not black were the prostitutes from the Dominican Republic. So often people would ask me if I, and because they were next door, they were like, are you from the house? And I'm like, no, no, I'm from next door to the house. And they're like, right. Um, but so you have, you have a whole different side of, you have very, you collect very interesting stories. You know, I collected very interesting stories from those women. And then in Cape Town, um, I met a lot of Muslim women um, living in this ghetto um, called Woodstock, and a lot of people from kind of, you know, either, you know, Portugal or um, you know, different different parts, like from Afghanistan. Different, I mean, just from all over the the world that were living kind of like in this hodgepodge of this neighborhood. Um, it was kind of a melting spot, and. Um, it, you hear all these stories and all these different religions and all these different practices and different ways of congregating. So you, you know, you smell different foods as you're walking up and down the street. And, you know, and then I, I feel like I, um, at one point I, I went down to Brazil and had a totally different experience. And then I came back and that's when um, I did the piece at the border. And it's, it's just, um, I think all these stories are what makes me want to kind of break down those walls and those barriers, you know, of the possibilities that exist, like the, especially like the, the stories of success where, you know, they moved somewhere and they were able to provide their families a better life, which is ultimately what happened with my own family. You know, my dad moved us and... I'm able to do this, I'm able to make art, I'm able to ideate and like imagine and create. And I think it's one of the most, he gave me access to play with my imagination, which is like the highest form of currency you can have, you know, possibility that one can dream of. Just check this again. Looking good. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about the uh, exhibit that's coming up? And, uh... So yeah, this, um, the pieces here are for an exhibition called Erasure, and that's, they're all based on a performance that I did where I painted a room black, and then I went in there with my black dress and my black stilettos, and I started um, like painting myself 
black like painting black pants and painting black sleeves and then almost like creating a, a burqa of sorts with paint and until I kind of actually entirely painted myself black out black into this black space and it was um, not really an homage, but more of a response to the disappeared students from Ayala, from Ayotzinapa in Mexico. That, um, you know, it's, I think it's one of the most absurd and direct acts of public violence. You know, we all know the story, we all, which is, they were, there were these students, 43 students that were on their way to protest the, like, the, 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 the mayor of the city, his wife was delivering a speech. And so they were gonna go protest the speech of the wife and the wife was like, you know, how dare they, blah, blah, blah. And so the mayor called one of the, the drug lords and said, you know, get rid of them, do something so they don't interrupt my, my wife's speech. And they did, they got rid of them. And, in the, and through, the, through that getting rid of them, there were also three other casualties. And, one of them was found with their face burned off, and then two more bodies were found buried, but the students were never found. And so there was a huge outcry in Mexico, and there was absolutely nothing that was done out of it. And, um, but there was this collective you know, bringing of consciousness and awareness of just like how outlandish um, and public this was, you know, this action of violence was. And so there were, through this protest, a, a lot of the, the, my friends and students were um, putting their profile pictures black on Facebook and on you know, whatever social media as a way to um, erase their own identity, but also kind of it's a, it's a symbol of mourning in Mexico. When you wear black, it's luto. So, um, but in this case, it was just the obliteration of, of identity. And so um, there's been a series of, 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 of actions and protests. And furthermore, like as an, you know, from a different art collective and saying like, there's this one poster that came out that got plastered all over the city. You know, if Peña Nieto's kids or so-and-so's the senator's kids would be one of those students, would people have remained this quiet? And so for me, it's like, um, as I paint myself out black, it's like who has the validity to live? Like who is worth living? Whose lives are worth talking about and discussing? And who's, you know, um, and in this case, you know, the, there's like a painting of a mouth, a painting of eyes, um, and it's like you hear the evil, you see the evil, and there's still nothing done, you know? It's still, it's still there. Um, and the, almost like the landscape itself, it's the black, and that the body is com completely obliterated. Um, and so the, the, the exhibit has like, it, there's no figures, there's no one figure ever represented throughout the exhibit, um, but there's body parts. And it's almost like a dismembered body, which is kind of the political body. Um, and uh, I use also a Rebecca Solnit, quote from her book, The Far Away Nearby, which is to hear is to, set, to hear is to let sound wander through the labyrinth of your ear, but to listen is to come up and meet it halfway or something like that. But there's, I think to listening is like the active engagement, you know, of like meeting information. And I think that so often when we, you know, um, there's, there's a mirror in the, in the text and so as you're reading this text, you're seeing yourself in there, and it's you know when you when you come up to a mirror, it's like you meet yourself, right? And so for me, it's like how do we meet other people's cries or pleas, or how do we how much do we engage? How much are we willing to give up ourselves? Like when information's provided, you know, it's like the revolution has been televised, and we're still doing nothing about it. And for me, it's like almost like a cry of like yeah, like see yourself in this information, and how does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, me too. March 10th. March 10th. Okay. Uh, <laughs> still going good. All right, I just have like maybe one or two. Okay. Um, well, so you went to the border. Maybe just, just briefly mention what you actually did with the racing. Oh, yeah. Um, 
So for Erasing the Border um, in 2011, that's when I went to Tijuana. And it was so funny because I, for years, I had, like I said, I had been doing actions there, you know, and there were so, there were very like Sisyphean based. There were these kind of very um, impossible tasks of like playing with the environment because the, there was something impossible of the space at the same time. It was kind of metaphoric for the space itself because you see these train tracks that are perforated into the sand. And it's, for me, it's so funny because train tracks are so much about movement and mobility and journey and access. And all of a sudden they're like surrealistically like <laughs> lifted from the floor and like they're, they're an impediment to movement. And they look like um, jail bars. Um, but it, like I said, it wasn't until much later and I had been trying to like figure out some sort of um, protest or manifestation action that would be directly on the wall, not in front of it or around it or about it, but like using the wall itself. And literally one day I woke up and I had this like lightning of the idea uh, because I had a, thought of like all these crazy things of like maybe if I go with like a big piece of machinery and like chops pieces of it off or something and you know one dream sometimes and uh, but then I was like paint you know it's like that's what I do that's what I use and why don't I use what's in my arsenal and 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 and, and get rid of it like in this very quiet way and so I. Went with my mom to Home Depot and we got, um, we literally had like 50 pantom chips and like little paint, you know, as you go in the paint section, there's like all these tons of blue. And we would run outside Home Depot and like look at it then with the sky and try and, and get the one that's most proximal. Um, and then the next day we took a 15 foot ladder and um, I did this performance where I scaled up on the ladder and started painting it out. Um, the police tried to stop me 15 minutes into it, and we ended up having, like, I almost got arrested, and then we ended up having, like, a 45-minute debate um, because I think they became enamored with the idea once they allowed me to explain the concept. And so they liked it, and they let me continue. And um, five hours later, I had painted, like, a huge portion of it out. Um, and then fast forward what years at 2015, uh, four years later, when I was invited to do this residency in Arizona, um, they asked me if I wanted to do a project and I said, you know, I'd like to do a second iteration of it, but it's no longer a performance piece, but it's more of a community building project in which I invite members of the community from all parts of Arizona and as well from Nogales itself to, to paint it out. And we had about 40 people, and there were from all over Arizona, and including people that had been deported. And it was it was much more expansive. I mean, it was literally like, you know, about 50 feet in length, um, and it was just this really beautiful coming together of people wanting to to see this thing go away. You know.